we'll start with uh, since uh, because it was October. That's the only reason that we decided to uh, uh, do chapters nine through eleven. So remember, we started with uh, chapter thirteen, with how to become a saint. That was the first chapter that I read, and I just thought it was a fantastic chapter. How in six pages. Uh, she talks about uh, not only how do we become a saint, the prescription for becoming a saint on our part, but also uh, what's the canonization process that she could describe. You know, she takes that first uh, subset of how to become a saint in relation to us. She takes the first two pages or two and a half pages to talk about that. And then in just four pages, she describes the whole canonization process and she doesn't even uh, quote any church documents or the catechism of the church. She just explains it in simple words. I thought, holy cow, she's just, uh, she's, got, she's got a knack of, uh, of writing and taking complicated ideas and just uh, broaching them succinctly and understandably for all of us. So there's very few, if you go through the book, there's very few footnotes at the bottom of the page or references to... Uh, even like a line in sacred scripture or, uh, or more of a church document, something from the catechism or one from one of the encyclicals. There are a few, but not many. She just is describing things in a, in a down-to-earth way and in a way that's her own. And so uh, because it was October, then the next chapters that I did read were on Mary. So chapter 9 is uh, What to Make of Mary, and then uh, chapter 10 is uh, like on um, the apparitions of Mary, Our Lady slash Our Ladies is what it's called. And then chapter 11 is then uh, uh, the Queen of the Angels. And so we'll, we'll touch on all three of those chapters tonight. And then I brought over the, the video series from Father Aaron, Bishop Aaron, that was the creed that he came out with, I think, last year. Or maybe it was two years ago. I'm not sure. But uh, we just didn't get a hold of it and use it because he came out with it so late. Uh, we didn't have, we'd already chosen our books for RCA last year. So uh, we'll go over the first uh, video. Uh, and it's just a six-part yeah, six part video series on, on the creed itself. So he'll go through the uh, lines of the creed. And that's really what the purpose of RCA is. It's, uh, it's for people that are are either going to be baptized in the faith, they've never been baptized before, so they're going to be baptized Catholic at the Easter Vigil, or they have been baptized, either Catholic or in another church, and, uh, but they have never received confirmation or, or the Eucharist in the Catholic Church. And so what you're supposed to do with RCA is really uh, teach them the creed, because that's the big part of confirmation, whether it's uh, an adult coming into the faith at the Easter Vigil or our young people that have been baptized Catholic and are going through the faith with their CCD program, what they have to do is uh, recite the creed in front of the bishop on their confirmation day. And so they have to know what does, what does the church believe, what do they believe about uh, their Catholic faith. And it's all in the creed. And so our RCA, or our CCD program that we have on the Sunday mornings here, that's just... Uh, they're supposed to start from the preschool, bless you, all the way through the confirmation class, uh, just talking about the creed. And of course, they'll touch on prayer and the sacraments and the moral uh, life of the church, uh, the moral life that the church wants us to live. They'll touch on those things as well. But the main part of uh, CCD is to explain that faith that we're reciting every Sunday. And so by the time they stand in front of the bishop, they know what their parents professed for them at their baptism. So all, there's no, in the, in the bishop's eyes, there's no difference between baptism and confirmation. They're the same, they're the same sacrament in a sense. You get the same theological, three theological virtues of faith, hope, and love uh, uh, that you did at baptism. You get those again at confirmation. It's this um, this uh, confirmation, this with uh, confirming of the faith that happens at confirmation, all those things happened at your baptism, except here your parents spoke for you. 
this is what we believe, and this is the faith that we're going to teach our child as he grows older, what it is that we believe. And this is him saying at his confirmation day, I do believe everything that my parents believed when they had me baptized. And I stand for myself on my own two feet in front of the bishop, and I declare my faith and reciting those 12 articles of the creed, or if the bishop does, the uh, baptismal creed where he says the, uh, the, tw the articles of faith and the, the confirmandi say, I do, just like the priest at a baptism says the articles of the, of the creed, and they say, I do. So that's why it's called the baptismal creed. But they're saying for themselves. And so remember, the bottom line is that when you're... Uh, that image of the person that your body and soul, and we'll touch on that especially with Mary tonight, is that uh, at baptism you're given an indelible mark and it heals that wound of original sin. At confirmation you're given another indelible mark. And so uh, most people are going to have, except for like uh, different people like Steve Jolly, that was our, our deacon Steve Jolly that celebrated the Mass with us here in Sublette on Sunday. You know, most people are going to have two indelible marks on their soul, one from their baptism, one from their confirmation. Certain uh, people that have received holy orders are going to have a third indelible mark on there. They, uh, these indelible marks, they make you look more and more like the second person of the Trinity. But uh, baptism is necessary for entrance into king, the kingdom of heaven. You're not going to get it back into God's house unless the Father sees the mark of his son on your soul. And so that's why we baptize people as babies. And then, when they grow up, we say, well, do you want this faith that your parents pledged for you at your baptism? Do you want that faith? They say yes, they get that second mark. So that when the Satan's going to be there at your judgment too, your particular judgment, he's not able to say, this person should be allowed in. This indelible mark that they have on their soul from baptism, their parents asked for that for them. They never wanted it. They were suckered into it. They didn't have a choice. They were a baby. They just got it. And then confirmation says, no, no, I, that person did ask for it them, for themselves. And so Satan doesn't have a leg to stand on at your judgment then. You did believe uh, that uh, God was one in three persons and you believe that the second person came and uh, uh, died for us and gave us the sacrament so that he could uh, have those indelible marks and get back into heaven. So that's what we'll go over tonight. Let's just start with that prayer to Our Lady of the Assumption. So that's the prayer that the people at West Brooklyn pray uh, more often than not. But when they're not praying that other prayer that, like to a loving God like we're doing now. But, uh, you know, here in Sublette we do the Our Lady, most, uh, to Our Lady Perpetual Health prayer in St. Patrick's Church, Maytown. They do a prayer to St. Patrick, huh? So their patroness is St. Mary the Assumption in West Brooklyn. This is the prayer that they're praying almost every Sunday, huh? And since we're talking about Mary, it, you know, it dovetails perfectly into what we're doing here. So let's start with that prayer, huh? In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. Amen. We pray together. Holy Mother Mary, we rejoice with you as we celebrate your glorious assumption into heaven. Mother Mary, it is a great comfort to us to realize that your precious body, the tabernacle of the infant Christ, is now in heaven with him. Your being taken into heaven is also like the resurrection of Christ's body, a pledge to us of the resurrection of our own bodies. Help us to realize this as we go about our work from day to day. Most pure Virgin Mary, help us to have great respect for these bodies of ours and for those of others, because we recognize in them the temple of the Holy Spirit, and because we look forward to seeing each other, body and soul, with you and your Son, Jesus Christ, forever in heaven. Amen. And the Lord be with you. Amen. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in the peace of Christ to learn more about your Catholic faith. Thank Thanks be to God. So we'll, we'll, we'll dive into that prayer and we'll, we'll pull some of that out when we get to the uh, talking about the Assumption of Mary. But it, it's just a, it's a, it's one of those beautiful prayers and it really summarizes our faith. Uh, you know, we see it coming through the spirituality of Mary. We see our Catholic faith coming out in that. 
But uh, uh, we'll start with chapter 9, uh, what to make of Mary is what she uh, entitles it. Uh, you know, a lot of the people that are coming into the Catholic faith, they, they don't realize, you know, what's this hang-up that the Catholics have with Mary, you know? Yeah, she's, uh, she's Jesus' mother, but, uh, you know, she's got this little part in the Bible, and, and after that, she doesn't really do anything. After the wedding feast at Cana, yeah, she's at the foot of the cross, but so is St. John. You know, they don't understand the, the big deal about Mary, and they have uh, different, uh, they don't have all of the same... Uh, dogmas to their faith that that we have, especially around Mary then. And so it's just interesting that, you know, she titles the chapter, What to Make of Mary, huh? So, uh, you know, she starts out, you know, what's special about Mary is that Mary is the mother of Jesus. So what are we on page uh, 70s or something? Here? Yeah, 69. Good. And it says, uh, she's talking about, you know, Mary's the mother of Jesus. Jesus is God. And therefore, Mary is the mother of God. So where is that little, uh, on page 71, midway down, you see that little short paragraph. It's only uh, three sentences long that I just read. This is like uh, one of those logical proofs. Mary is the mother of Jesus. Jesus is God. And therefore, Mary must be the mother of God. So it's, it's plain and simple. So far, so good. She says no problems. The problem comes up, though, when the church wanted to make, make it clear that Mary was not what they use, she used the word, she was not the originator of God, huh? And so, you know, when we say that Mary gave birth to God, you know, we want to make sure that we don't uh, um, make the mistake of thinking that Mary was there before God was there, right? Like in the, our case, we can't say that. Like our mother and our father have to precede us or we can't come into existence, right? It just doesn't, just doesn't work that way, right? Uh, remember on Mork and Mindy, Murph was, uh, who was that one actor? Uh, not Don DeLuise, but... Uh, Robin Williams. Yeah, Robin Williams was, was, was Mork, and then Mindy was his girlfriend. And yeah. I think they got married at the end. I can't remember that show, but they had a, they had a child, and his name was Murph. And he was, uh, I can picture the guy, he's kind of fat. He hung around, not even, that was, uh, wasn't the guy that hung around with Burt Reynolds. That was Dom DeLuise. But he was like, you know how Hollywood, they get like two people that look the same. Like, who is it? Uh, I think that Charlie Sheen, I can't tell the difference between Charlie Sheen and uh, who's the one that the women go crazy for? The other dark-haired actor. Uh, Help me out, help me out. <laughs> There's so many. I Who's in uh, uh, that uh, Independence Day, that science fiction movie, Independence Day? Uh, I can't remember. They'll come up. But I think they, those guys look the same. Well, this is, these two comedians look the same, too. Well, in uh, Mork and Mindy, Murph, uh, on the planet, wherever Mork was from, uh, you, you, you were born old, and then as you aged, you got younger. So, you know, Mork, you know, uh, he had already lived 40 years of his life, but he had lived it from the older, so he was getting younger. And that was part of the dilemma. Mindy was worried. You know, my husband's going to be looking younger and younger. I'm going to be looking older and older. What are people going to say? You know, well, Murph, he's like 70 years old when he's born, and so and he's going to get younger as he ages. And so... Uh, I remember the big thing was uh, Mindy says to him, Murph, we're going to have a family meeting. And he says, oh, what, are we going to have steak tonight? <laughs> that was that joke or whatever. But, you know, it started, it started backwards on that planet that Mork was from. But not on this planet, huh? We, our, we, our parents give birth to us. So this problem that church wants to make sure that people don't think that Mary precedes God and gave... Uh, is the originator of God. And so some, when they were trying to describe this, some of the people wanted to, uh, to deny that the Christ person had two natures. And I think we have to go into uh, the hierarchy of truths then to explain that. So uh, this isn't in the book, but we need to step back and just explain it. So the hierarchy of truths, if you have a triangle, and uh, yeah, there's five 
there's five hier hierarchies of truth, just like your hand. And so at the top of the hierarchy is, is there's one God. And the, uh, the formula for the one God is there's one God, uh, one nature, and three persons. So what's his nature? He's divine. But he's three persons. So that's the pinnacle of our faith, this hierarchy of truths. You know, we're, as we're going to come down the hierarchy, we could say that they're of lesser importance, but we can also say that each one of these hierarchies then is dependent on the one above it. And so there's the nature of God. He's, there's one God. He's a of a divine nature, and he's, yet he's three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then the second... Uh, hierarchy is Jesus Christ, and the formula for Jesus is that uh, he's one person with two natures. And so he's one, he's the second person of the Trinity, and yet he has two natures. He has a divine nature as God, and he has a human nature that was given to him by Mary. Okay? And then the third hierarchy of truth is, is salvation. And so uh, the formula is, is that uh, uh, it's the Paschal Mystery. So you always hear that. I don't know if you, people understand what the Paschal Mystery is. But the Paschal Mystery is the life of Christ. It's his birth, his life, death, his life, passion, death, and resurrection, and ascension in glory. That's the Paschal mystery. It's the life of Christ. That Christ came, uh, in a sense, to die for us. So that's the, you know, that's the, the biggest thing that you try to get people uh, to understand at Christmas is this aspect of the Paschal ministry. Yeah, Christ is born, but the purpose of his birth is only so that he can die for us. So that's the wild thing. You know, people are like, which is more important? There it is. Uh, which is more important? Uh, the hierarchy of truth is on that bulletin board. Uh, <laughs> that's from a couple years ago. What's more important? The birth of Christ? Christmas is more important than Easter? Or is Easter more important than, than Christmas? Well, the, in the ranking of the solemnities, you know, Easter is, is, the, is the pinnacle. It's the most important day. It's the day of the, the, the death and resurrection of Christ. So um, if, if Jesus doesn't rise from the dead, then, like St. Paul says, uh, all of us are just going to die in, uh, in, in our sins, and, we're, and there, is no, there is no life after death. So it has to be that uh, Christ gives us uh, eternal that gift of eternal life by his death and resurrection. So Easter is the most important thing. But we can't get to Easter, or Jesus can't get to Easter without his birth on Christmas. And so which is more important? Well, Easter is, but you can't have the death of Christ until he's born. So you see the dilemma that's there. But uh, the salvation, the formula is, is that it's Christ's death and resurrection one for us, our faith, hope, and love. So the formula is that faith, hope, and love are born, uh, are part of the Paschal mystery. That Christ was born, lived, underwent a passion, died, was resurrected in ascension to give us those theological virtues of faith, hope, and love. That's the third hierarchy. And then the fourth is the, the founding of the church. So Jesus came to build a church. And so the formula is, is that uh, the bride of Christ is the church, the bride of Christ, or the body of Christ is what the church is. So what's the church? It's the bride that Jesus Christ came to wed as the Son of God. It's the body of Christ. If Christ is the head, the church is the body. So you, you can't say, I love Jesus Christ 
and I hate the Catholic Church. Because that's like saying, I love Howard McInnes, but I hate Karen McInnes, his wife. You know, if I come up to Howard and I say that, I'm not going to be friends with him. You know, he's like, it's like, I'm a package deal, Howard says. I'm married to this woman. That she's one, uh, we, her and I are of one flesh. Uh, you can't separate your love for me from your love for her. You either love us both or you don't love either of us. Same thing, Bob and Pauline, you know, Chris and uh, Ed. It's the same thing all the way across the board, no matter what it is. So Christ is the groom, the church is the bride. Jesus is the head, the church is the body. You can't just say, you know, you know and that's, that's, the, you know, that's Jacob's dilemma, right? Jacob gets tricked by his father-in-law and to uh, marry in both of his daughters, so Rachel and Leah. So remember, Rachel had the beautiful face, and Leah had the beautiful body, right? And, you know, there's the mystery of Christ's marriage to the church. He's the bridegroom of the church. Jacob has to marry both daughters. He's a, uh, a uh, it's like a, it would be called like a, a type of Christ. Jacob is a type of Christ. All the patriarchs are. He has to marry the head, Rachel, as, as well as the body, Leah. That's, that's too weird for you guys right now. Just forget <laughs> that. That's like for like when you're finally graduating, you're going to be ordained a priest or something. And then the third part after the church, the, fourth, the fifth hierarchy is the sacraments. So what do the sacraments give us? What does the church give us? She gives us the sacraments. All the sacraments, though, are born from the wounded side of Christ. So when that soldier stabbed the side of Christ, Outflow blood and water. The blood, that's a symbol of the Eucharist. The water, that's a symbol of baptism. So those are the two greatest sacraments. Again, you know, which is better? Baptism or the Eucharist? It's like, which is more powerful? Easter or Christmas? You know, you're going to be chasing your tail. It's the same thing. You just, uh, we, have to, we have to differentiate it because we're human. But uh, there's no difference in God's eyes. There all seven of these sacraments came from the pierced side of Christ when that blood and water flowed out. It's just that we have, we have to differentiate. We have to give the seven sacraments on different occasions to different people at different times in their life. Okay? So this is the hierarchy of truths, what you have to realize before we can go into this next part then. So some wanted to deny this union of Christ's two natures. So they're denying the second hierarchy of the truth, second hierarchy of faith which is that Jesus is one person, he's one man, but he's both man and God. And so that's what we say in the creed, right? So he's true God and true man. God from God, light from light, true God from true God, and begotten, not made. So that's his divinity. But then we say in that line of the creed, uh, he was born of the Virgin Mary. Huh? That's where he, ex he gets the humanity his humanity from Mary, right? Okay, so St. Cyril of Alexandria, way back in the, uh, in the 5th century at the Council of Ephesus, he's explaining that a mother gives birth to a person, not to a nature, right? And so Jesus is one divine person. He's the second person of God with two natures. His mother's human nature and his father's divine nature. So Mary, in giving birth to Jesus, gave birth to the God-man. He's both God and man. And you can't separate those two things. Just like you can't separate the husband from his wife in the marriage, the two will become one flesh. You can't separate the divinity and the humanity of Christ. And some, some people are wanting to do that. And since so it's, it's two natures in this one person. It's not like all of the divinity is consumed the whole body and on the fingernail or the tip of the little fingernail or something. That's the humanity of Christ. So some of the, uh, the early Catholics, they wanted to divide that up and make distinctions. You know, there's always that question. Did Christ know who was going to betray him? Did he know, uh, you know, what miracles they were going to ask him to do? Yeah, he knew all that stuff because, you know, as God... 
he's outside of time. But as a human being, he's going through life just like we do in a body where things happen sequentially. So with God, time, there is no past, present, and future. It's all the present. What happened 2,000 years ago to God is like it happened today. And what happens is going to happen 2,000 years from now. God sees that already. It's happening. It's, it's just there. It's, it's already occurred in God's eyes. But to us, we have to go through time. And time is, the physicists have it right, the cosmologists, they say, time is what prevents everything from happening all at once. Well, to God, everything did happen at once. But to our conscious, we can't, can't understand that. We can't go through and have everything occur at once because we're, we'd be overloaded. We couldn't understand anything that happened in our life if it all just occurred right now in this one 24-hour day that we experienced. I wonder if that's why when people die and come back and they see everything that's happened in their lives, some of them say uh, that. They flash, their life flashes before them. Their life flashes before them. Yeah, so they say outside that. outside of time at that point. Right, and exactly. And they come back into time. Again. See, the, what's happened is they're at death your soul and body are separated. And so when you're in the body, when your soul and body are the same, they're united as the one person that you are, you have to experience things sequentially as they occur in time. But your soul isn't like that, right? Yeah. It experiences everything at once. And this is what God the Father looks like, and this is what God the Holy Spirit looks like, right? They're pure spirit. It's only the second person the Trinity that looks like you and I, body and soul. See that? And so Jesus experiences everything just like we do, one moment, one day at a time, for 33 years then. And then when he dies on Calvary, where he, his body, we buried in the tomb, his soul goes down to purgatory to uh, uh, rouse the souls that are there to come to heaven that are, have been waiting for him to beckon them into eternal life. But that's the thing. At, on Easter Sunday, the body of Christ is raised from the dead. It rejoins his soul. And so what do the apostles see? And Mary Magdalene, they see the wounds of Christ on his body, but he's not dead. He's alive. The soul entered back into the body. And when you see and I see God, or the second person of, of the Trinity in heaven, he will still have a body, and we'll see what he looked like. What color were Jesus' eyes? Well, you'll know when you see him. You, but you'll still see him. He's continually showing God the Father the wounds in his hand. Always. Otherwise, we're sunk. If he doesn't say, this is what I incurred for my brothers and sisters. I want them to be in heaven. I died for them. If God doesn't, the Father doesn't keep getting that reminder from the second person of the Trinity that he he was born, he lived his life, he underwent a passion, he died, was buried and rose from the dead, all for us, then we don't get back into the kingdom. It has to be that Jesus is the reason that we get into heaven. So then it goes back to, I put those indelible marks on their soul. I did myself so that we could do it. So that's what a farmer does, or a cattle rancher. He brands every cow that's his. This one's mine. Jesus says that. This one's mine. I baptized them. They were there at my baptism. I confirmed them. They spoke the faith at their confirmation. I put my indelible mark on them so I would know which ones come to the judgment, which ones my father's supposed to let in. Right? So that's why when you go to your judgment, your body's still buried here in our cemetery. Right? You go to your particular judgment, Jesus is looking at your soul. Do you have those indelible marks on you? Will you eventually be in heaven? Yeah, you got those indelible marks. You go to purgatory to make up for all the damage your sins have caused because we didn't do enough because the priest didn't assign us enough penance when we confessed our sins. And eventually you're going to get into heaven, though. And, you, and you'll get that resurrected body again. But you're just in purgatory. You're just a soul. Your body's being eaten by the worms over here in our cemetery. But we keep the grass really nice, cut clean and everything, and people come put flowers at your grave all the time. Where are we here? Okay, Mary in giving birth to Jesus, God and man, is indeed the mother of God. So that Greek word, theotokos, it's, it just means mother of God in Greek language. The mother of God. 
So it is Mary's motherhood, and in particular, so here's now, this is where this Susie Andress uh, really comes out. This is her talking now. It's Mary's motherhood, and in particular, her motherhood of our Lord, that is at the root of the Catholic devotion to her. But there's another side of her motherhood that equally awakens our love. And that's where she goes to, she quotes uh, the scripture in John's gospel where Jesus is dying on the cross and Mary and John are there. And he looks at Mary and he says, woman, behold your son. And he looks at John and he says, behold your mother. When God says, and this is, uh, this is her words, when God says something, it is. St. Thomas would say, Aquinas would say, truth himself speaks truly, or there is nothing true. What is the truth? It's Jesus Christ. You know, Pontius Pilate asked the question at the trial of Jesus, what is truth? It's staring him in the face. The truth is Jesus Christ. There is no other truth in the universe than that Jesus is the Son of God. And yet, uh, you know, Jesus can't get Pilate to understand that. Um, but, you know, Jesus, God says something, and it is. And so we're on page 72 of the third paragraph down. Here's, uh, here's Susie Andres speaking. When God says something, it's page 72, see it? The third paragraph. When God yeah. says something, it is. On the very first page of the Bible we read, And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. Right? He just says the word and it happens. Let there be trees. There's trees. Let there, the sky separate from the sea. It, it happens. Uh, when Jesus says to, the de to Lazarus, come out, Lazarus comes out. When Jesus says, this is my body, this is my blood, that's what it is. Right? Well, how do we understand that? We don't know what the truth is, but Jesus told us what the truth is. You see that? You don't have to go through. That's why we can't describe the Eucharist and get people to understand that we believe that the Eucharist is the body, blood, soul, and divinity of, of the second person of the Trinity. How does that happen? How did God create the light? How did God create the universe? He just spoke it, the truth, and it happened. How did that happen? We don't know. The cosmologists don't know. Why is there matter and antimatter, but there's more matter than antimatter. We don't know. It just, it just is. God spoke it and it happened. What's the truth of the Eucharist, the pinnacle of our faith? Jesus said at the Last Supper, this is my body, it's broken for you, take it and eat it. This is my blood, it's poured out for you, take it and drink it. Is it the body and blood of Christ? Yes, because Jesus told us it is. There's no other reason than that is what it is. God said it, it is the truth. Pontius Pilate, the rest of the, the world, what is truth? The truth is Jesus Christ. That's the end, end of the story, you know? She sums it up right there. And then she throws in St. Thomas Aquinas. He tells us in the Eucharistic hymn, Eterote uh, Devote, truth himself speaks truly or there's nothing true. And so when our Lord says in his dying words, Behold your mother and behold your son, he again affects what he speaks. Mary becomes mother of all mankind, and every person becomes her child. Right? And so that's why there's something special about Mary. That, yeah, she's special because she's the mother of God. She gave birth to Jesus' humanity. That alone you know, makes Mary special. And why the Protestants don't see that quite, but uh, what also makes Mary special is that uh, she's our mother too. And so Mary is the most maternal creature that God ever made. She's sinless, immaculate, perfect in her purity, her unselfishness, her intimacy with God, her power over God's heart. So we see at the, at the wedding feast at Cana, she uh, asks her son to work the miracle doesn't know what the miracle will be, but she asks him for a miracle, and, it, and he works the miracle. So there's something special about Mary in that we've been, uh, we've been given her as our mother, and she looks at us as her children. And so she has this little paragraph about on page 72. You know, if you, if you really loved your mom, 
your natural mother or your adopted mother, then you understand that to some degree. Even if you, if you didn't have the loving pre presence of a mother in your life or your mom, you know, you know, she just didn't live up to what your expectations as a mom should be. Mary, uh, you wouldn't know what a mother should be like. That's Mary. She's for you. She's the perfect mother. And that's, that's God's gift to us uh, from the cross. One of the last gifts that Jesus gave us on earth was to have Mary as our mother. Okay? So then she goes into the elements of, of Mary, the Immaculate Conception, her purity, the Assumption, <clears throat> and we already talked about the divinity of Mary. So her Immaculate Conception on December 8th in 1854, Pope Pius IX, he declared, and she gives the uh, actual summons from Ineffabilis uh, Deus, the ineffable God. Uh, she, uh, she quotes Pope Pius IX. He said, this is on page, uh, bottom of 73, the Blessed Virgin Mary, uh, to have been from the first instant of her conception, by a singular grace and privilege of Almighty God, and in view of the merits of Christ Jesus, the Savior of mankind, she was preserved free from all stain of original sin. So all of us, because Adam and Eve sinned, when we're born <clears throat> and before our baptism, we have, you know, like, just imagine there's a hole in your soul. That's what original sin is. So you're not perfect. You, your soul's been damaged by the sin that Adam and Eve uh, committed. And so every human soul is born like that. Well, by... If you read the definition of the, uh, the, the dogma of the Immaculate Conception, the Holy Father is saying from the first instant of her conception, so when we're talking about Mary now, when one cell came from St. Anne and one cell came from St. Joachim, so Mary has parents just like us, a mom and a dad, when those two cells came together at the moment of her conception, God imbued Mary's body, two cells big with a soul, an eternal soul, just like us, except her soul didn't look like this. Her soul was perfect. It's a singular event that happened, a singular grace and privilege of Almighty God, and it's through the merits of Jesus Christ. Right? Jesus, even though Mary is born before the human person of Christ, Christ's birth has already occurred in God the Father's reality. And Jesus already died before Mary is born. So even though there's this timeline that shows, you know, here's Adam and Eve, here's the birth of Mary, here's the death of Christ, here's the birth of Christ, and here's the death of Christ, you know, uh, even though there's this timeline where, you know, what is time? It's just something that happens, so, something that, so that everything doesn't happen at once. That's all that time is. It, it's a reality so that we can experience things sequentially instead of experiencing them like God does. They happen all at once. They're, God is continually living in the present. And the present to God is the past, the future, and the present. So God right now is watching his son die, watching his son be born, watching his son go down to purgatory, watching his son bring you into heaven. God the Father is seeing all those events at the same time, and he can handle it. And for a, a couple, eight billion plus people, he can handle that. He can handle all that stuff going on at once, but we can't. And so, where are we going with this? Uh, so the death, it's the privilege it's by the merit of Jesus Christ, death on the cross. So each one of us has the wound of original sin erased from our souls when we're baptized. Where do we get the baptism from? How does baptism have that power? The baptism, it's a sacrament of the church. We get the sacraments from the church. Where did the church get them from? From the Paschal mystery, the, passion, the birth, the life, the passion, the death, the resurrection, ascension, and glory of Jesus Christ. Where did Jesus get him from? He's God, and 
he's the third, he's the second person of the Trinity. And so you trace baptism back up through the hierarchy of faith. And what God is saying is that, or what Pope is saying in 1854 on December 8th, that through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, Mary was given uh, the gift of not having that womb be there, but automatically being born with the indelible mark on her soul. She's already perfect. The Christ made her soul perfect because she's to be his mother and give him his human nature. And so the Christ doesn't know sin his whole life. God, Jesus never sins his whole life. And he can't have the stain of sin touch him at any point. Is that part of the Mary Magdalene thing? Yeah, it's a little bit, but we're not going to get there because it's too deep for us. Remember, Jesus says, don't touch me. I haven't risen to the Father yet. You know, I've got to bring this perfect life to heaven. Um, so Mary has to be perfect because she touches. The Christ is growing in her womb for nine months, just like us. And so by a singular instance of grace and a privilege in view of the merits of Jesus Christ, the Savior of mankind, Mary's preserved free from all stain of original sin. So she never has that hole in her soul like the rest of us does. She's born at her conception. She's already got the mark of Christ on it. Because the death and resurrection of Jesus already occurred in God's eyes. So she put the thing on there automatically from the get-go. So I think we call that sanctifying grace. And the angel says, Hail Mary, full of grace. Right. Yeah, she's now, already full of grace. She had it from the get-go. Right. And didn't need to be baptized. Yeah. Uh, yeah. All, I just want to say, everything you've said so far is so utterly Catholic. And if we didn't know it, we're learning it now, and we accept it. And a moment ago you said something about you don't know what's with the Protestants and why <laughs> Sorry. And no, uh, I I listened to uh, a fellow on uh, EWTN, the show called Call to Communion, Dr. David Anders, and he he uh, he has very uh, sound explanation of why the Protestants don't, and it had to do with these men, uh, Luther and uh, yeah, Zwingli and. I, the, the, the Calvinist, mm -hmm. John Calvin and Zwingli, yep. and there's a couple more. And he points out that um, it, it was these men that changed the course. They redefined all this stuff. And they threw stuff out, and they brought stuff in, mm -hmm. and uh, he says, where did they get this? Yeah. And he says, he studied them carefully. He was going to be a Calvinist minister. And he studied them. He wrote his dissertation on them. He says, the, he uses a kind of uh, irreverent expression. He says, they pulled it out of their ear. Meaning, wherever they got it, it certainly wasn't in the tradition. Of right. It was just, yeah. they, they reconstructed this whole thing. Mm -hmm. And so, here we have our Protestant our separated brethren, as we call them. And, uh, you know, these people just learn, they, they, they just accept what they learn. Sure. They, and that's why they don't get it. <coughs> they weren't taught it, yeah. No, they weren't taught it. Yeah. Their whole life is based on mm -hmm. assuming that what they've been taught is... Is the truth. Is the truth. Yeah, why should they, why should they doubt that? Yeah. Right. <coughs> and so, I, I have a lot of sympathy Right, good. Yeah. You know, I'm not. I'm not, yeah. I'm not trying to. I'm just, no, I think I'm that's just, a good word. I yeah, I. Word. I just think I have Protestant friends that are very devout, mm -hmm. and they say so many things that uh, are are in basic disagreement with everything you just said. That it's. I just have to keep my mouth shut. <laughs> You, you know, I you can go back to the founders of the church and read yeah. what they say because that's right. where the traditions come from. 
So, because, so yeah. So we we said with the second uh, hierarchy, you know, that at the Council of Ephesus, that's where Saint Cyril of Jerusalem is saying, you know, uh, Mary gives birth to a person, not a nature. And so we we're we're formulating these things back in the fifth century, you know. Mm -hmm. And it, this is a progression because you know Jesus ascends, and we don't know all of this stuff yet. You know, it's the uh, we have to, you know, Jesus said, uh, the Holy Spirit will remind you of everything that I said and will teach you this, what, uh, the truth so that you'll know it to be able to pass it on to your brothers. So he says to Peter specifically, you have to be the one that once, you're, once you've fallen and you've gotten back up, you have to be the one that teaches your brothers. You know, but so it's going to be, you know, from the, the, the church fathers, uh, which are the, uh, the next bishops after the, the apostles, you know, this is, this is like, uh, you know, six centuries of blood, sweat, and tears and the blood of the martyrs to get these elements of our hierarchy. Yeah, and, and, and beyond that, I mean, you're, you're talking about things that maybe Thomas Aquinas brought to light or, uh, in other words, our whole... <laughs> yeah, so our these, whole, yeah, whole these things are there. They're there at the beginning. And so our, our, is the church getting smarter? Yeah, she's learning more about these same five things that have always been there. I think that's the point. That we're, yeah. we're, it's not that we're progressing so much as that we, it's we it's contain, we as it's Catholics developing. continually uh, yeah, it, we're address, growing these, in faith. address these issues and we keep coming up in a certain way you might say we keep coming up with the same answers. It, right, we, right. We don't, we don't decide, oh well wait a minute yeah. maybe it could be this way. Yeah. I don't think that happens, and I think that's what the so-called reformers did, is they had different ideas. Now, there were other sociological uh, causes or things that made the Reformation uh, ripe to happen, uh, but th these men, uh, they were dummies. They, they were very smart men, and they had different ideas on how to put things together, and they did, and they had the opportunity to rebel against the church, and they did, and they had followers, and then all of a sudden, we got the whole Protestant thing going on, and uh, it's, it's sort of unnerving yeah. when, when we believe what you say, I mean, I'm, not, I'm saying that's because you represent our faith in the church, what you're teaching is Catholic, mm -hmm. and that's who we are. Yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah. I don't know, I just, yeah. you, you know, and a, f a fellow said to me once, he was admonishing me, and he was kind of uh, uh, attacking me, actually, and he said, uh, yeah, you and your whole sacramental system. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, yeah. I just looked at him, I said, well, maybe we better not talk about that. Let's talk about what we agree on. You know. So you can go to baptism and confirmation or something. You yeah, know, they, I mean, they agree with that for a second. It sacrament. was clear to me that he was so hostile mm -hmm. that I, w I didn't want to start a fist fight over, <laughs> you know, sacraments. Yeah. But, but sometimes it, se it seems, I, I'm not saying that I really would do that, but just... It can be very infuriating dealing you know, with them because they do get so hostile, but you just have to remember to keep calm through it, and a lot of times find the common denominator yeah, and start with exactly. that. Exactly. Yeah. And then exactly. work through going that way. In this case, uh, this fellow is a very devout evangelical Protestant, and I said, I know we agree that life begins at conception and that the, the, the life of the womb is life and precious. Yeah, we do. Yeah. And, and so we were able to move past what could have been just a yeah. row of uh, sure. unpleasantries. Yeah. And I think part of the, some of the, uh, the theologians will describe it as the faith as being, uh, it's like, uh, like a human person. Uh, uh, the, the person uh, in his birth and adolescence is growing towards the mature adult and it's the same person that you see uh, at their funeral as what their mother and father saw 
at their birth. It's the same person. It's just developed and it's aged and it's uh, yeah, it's developed into this mature human being. All the parts were smaller when it was first born. It, those are the same parts are still there. The cells still have the same genetic material, but it's manifesting itself different. And the Protestant Church, uh, they didn't like the way the person looked, called the Catholic Church. They didn't like the way the the faith was looking as a person, how it had developed and how, what its stature was, and its uh, its phenotype as the biologists would say, and so they started, we don't like the way that church looks, we want the church to look this way, and that's how their, their faith comes then. It doesn't have a development from a nascent into a full maturity, well, and that's what the Catholic Church is. It's the, it's the human person come fully to the realization of what faith, hope, and love do to a human body. Well, not only that, they, they, uh, I, I haven't ever engaged them personally on this, but I've heard that many Protestants don't even think that the church exists. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like there wasn't a church. And they would come to establish the church, Jesus came to death, is what I'll say. Yeah, or, yeah, and it's all kind of personal one one to one thing, it's not the body of Christ. As a, as a community, as a communion of people, which is where we are. Uh, and I just wanted to say those things. That okay. I, I'm really uh, seeing, you know, this this whole thing that Father just put up here. This is a this is like a very tight structure that exists, and it's ours. Mm -hmm. And you can explain it, and you've just started to explain it. And, sidestep certain issues that might be too complicated or whatever. But, you know, this this is our faith. This is what we have. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh gosh. So I mean, yeah, the so you the did a great job. Another do dogma then is the Assumption of Mary, that's November first, nineteen fifty by Pope Pius the Twelfth, that uh, Mary, Immaculate Mother of God, ever virgin, after finishing the course of course of her life on earth, was taken up in body and soul to heavenly glory. And so, you know, if you dovetail that uh, line from the, the dogma of the Assumption of Pius XII with our prayer of Our Lady of the Assumption, you get uh, an understanding of that. But she makes the point, uh, uh, Susie makes the point of uh, in Munificus uh, Deus, so the most magnificent God, uh, Mary Macklet, Mother of God, ever virgin, finishing the course of her life on earth, was taken up body and soul to heavenly glory. If you read that definition, she says, over carefully, you can see that Pope Pius managed to include all four Marian dogmas in one sentence. So he, she, he talks about uh, Mary's immaculate conception, her perpetual virginity, her, uh, her being the mother of God, and her assumption of, of into heaven, body and soul then. So it doesn't say the, the nuance of the way the Holy Father wrote the, uh, the dogma. It doesn't say when Mary died. It just says when she... Uh, came to the, when, after finishing the course of her life on earth, she was taken up body and soul into heaven. So Mary, you know, again, just like never experienced that wound of original sin. Uh, so when she goes to her judgment, she's already got those indelible marks on her soul that the Christ gave her. She enters her body and soul don't separate like us. So does Mary incur a, a death like ours? No, oh, it's different. So her soul never comes out of her body, so to speak. She rises to glory. So there's no, uh, there's no relics of the Blessed Virgin of her body. There's, there could be second or third class relics, but there's, we're not going to have, like we have with Mother Teresa, uh, relics of her hair. So there's hair follicles. I guess we could have that. But we don't. Uh, she rose, you know. So what? The, what did the daughters of uh, the daughters of charity do when Mother Teresa died? They cut the locks of her hair and they cut them into little one centimeter uh, strands and they passed them out all over the world so that people could have relics of Saint Mother Teresa. So we, that's when we on November first when we expose our relics. We have the mother, the relics of Mother Teresa. They have two little hair follicles in the shape of a cross in a little reliquary. And uh, 
a relic case, and then we put that on our altar to celebrate All Saints Day. So Mary in rising, uh, the apostles, they, uh, they can't find her body at the Assumption. After she passed from this life, her body's not to be buried. She rose, body and soul, to her judgment, and that's why I passed out this. So Michelangelo's got, in his uh, Last Judgment uh, 